what interests me is how bits and atoms relate, the boundary between um, digital and physical. Uh, scientifically, it's the most exciting thing I know. It has all sorts of implications uh, that are widely covered almost exactly backwards. Um, and playing it out, what I thought was hard technically is proving to be pretty easy. What I didn't think was hard is the implications for the world. And so a bigger piece of uh, what I do is that. So let's start with digital. Um, there's a lot of hubbub about what's the next MIT and what's the next Silicon Valley. And those are all the last war. Technology is leading to very different answers. So to explain that, let's go back to the science underneath it and then, and then look at what it leads to. So digital, digital is everywhere, digital is everything. Uh, I think it's one of the most widely misunderstood concepts. Uh, there's, there's, in computing, there's a notion of a sign bit error where you calculate something and you get one bit wrong. So the sign is the opposite of what it should be, which means everything you calculate is the opposite of what it's supposed to be. And there's a sense in which that's happening right now in maybe three different areas. So uh, Claude Shannon wrote the best master's thesis ever uh, when he was at MIT, inventing digital. He went on to Bell Labs and he did really two core things. And the one that I'm, that's most interesting for me is uh, he proved the first threshold theorem. And so what that means is uh, I could send my voice to you today as a wave or I could send it to you as a symbol. And what he showed is if I send it to you as a symbol, for a linear increase in the resource used to represent the symbol, there's an exponential reduction in the error of you getting the symbol correctly, as long as the noise is below a threshold. If the noise is above the threshold, you're doomed. But if it's below a threshold, a linear increase in the symbol gives you an exponential reduction in error. Um, there are very few exponentials in engineering. And that's, that's the big one. So what he showed is you can communicate reliably even though the communication medium is unreliable. Um, that's what digital means. That's, that's the essence of digital. Now, it wasn't obvious. Claude Shannon got that. He went to Bell Labs. Uh, when I was at Bell Labs, Bob Lucky was still around and could tell me stories. And so Claude Shannon had this idea we should communicate digitally. And there was a real battle between analog communication and digital communication. And the sobering lesson from Bob Lucky is the resolution of the battle was death. The um, analog managers died, and a new generation of digital managers took over, and then we had digital communication, and now the internet. But the meaning of digital is this threshold property, this exponential scaling. In turn, digital computing, uh, at around that time, uh, computers were analog. Vannevar Bush at MIT made a differential analyzer, which is a room full of gears and pulleys, and the answer got worse with time. And what, what John von Neumann did was show you could compute reliably with an unreliable computing device by computing with a symbol. And it was exactly applying Shannon to viewing a communication as a computation as a communication through the channel of the computer. And so he showed you can compute reliably with unreliable devices. And the heart of it isn't ones and zeros, it's this th threshold property, the exponential scaling, the exponential reduction in error. So those are the digital revolutions in communication and computation. We'll come back to von Neumann because what he did in computation afterwards is, com I'd say, relatively completely misunderstood in computer architecture. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to that. So we, have, on. Yep. so we have digital communication, we have digital computation. The thing I've been most recently involved in is digital fabrication. And this is the first of the sign bit errors I want to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, Shannon was digitizing communication and von Neumann was digitizing computing. At MIT in 1952, the first a uh, numerically controlled billing machine was made. So you can argue that's digitizing fabrication. In Norbert Wiener's Servo Mechanism Laboratory, uh, uh, the Whirlwind computer from Project Sage, which was an early air defense computer, 
was one of the first computers you could actually do anything in real time rather than batch. And so there was this idea that you could connect the computer to a machine to turn the cranks on a milling machine and make aircraft parts. At the time, this was a huge leap. It was connecting two alien realms, this new computer thing and a milling machine. And what it let you do is make aircraft parts you couldn't make any other way. So digital fabrication in that sense dates back to 1952. Mm -hmm. Now there's lots and lots of attention about maker movement and digital fabrication, but it misses the point, which is uh, from 1952, um, in the 80s, Chuck Hall invented 3D printing. Now, if you run a shop like mine at CBA, where we have one of every kind of computer controlled manufacturing machine, there's maybe 20 processes you uh, can control a computer to make something. Um, cut with lasers, supersonic jets of water, EDM with wires, machining, plasmas, fusing, bonding. Once you have all of those, uh, for all the attention to 3D printing, um, we might use 3D printers 20% of the time. The other 80% of the time, other machines are faster, make higher performance parts, all of that. Maybe 20% of the time, 3D printing is best. Uh, 3D printing isn't a rev revolution, it's decades old, um, and once you have all the digital fabrication tools, it, 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 it's a little bit like uh, microwave ovens in the 50s. The kitchen of the future is going to have one appliance and you push a button and make all your food. And of course, we still have a stove and you wouldn't get rid of your stove even though you have the microwave oven. What all of that misses is it's analog. The design is digital, but the process is smushing material. And you might cut it or you might squirt it, but it's smushing material. Go back further to the real invention is four billion years old, and that's the evolutionary age of the ribosome. And to understand the ribosome, think about a child playing with Lego bricks and compare it to a state-of-the-art 3D printer. The child and the ribosome do much the same thing. So when the child assembles Lego bricks, first attribute is metrology comes from the parts. When you snap the bricks together, you don't need a ruler to play Lego. The geometry comes from the parts. What it means is a child can make a Lego structure bigger than themselves. Mm -hmm. um, in the same way in the ribosome, the Lego bricks are amino acids, and um, the amino acid the, the ribosome assembles amino acids to elongate a protein, and you can make an elephant one amino acid at a time mm -hmm. because the geometry comes from the parts. Mm -hmm. In a 3D printer today, what you can make is the size of the volume of the machine. The geometry is external. Mm -hmm. Second difference, now we come to the um, Shannon part, is the Lego tower is more accurate than the child because the constraint of assembling the bricks let you detect and correct errors. So the tower is more accurate than the motor control of the child. In the ribosome, if you mix chemicals, the yield is, so in a lab when you mix chemicals, the yield is maybe a part per hundred. In the ribosome, making proteins, the error rate is a part in 10 to the four. And when you replicate DNA, there's an extra step of error correction and the error rate is 10 to the eight, one in 10 to the eight. And that one in 10 to the eight is the exponential. That's the exponential scaling for working reliably with unreliable parts. Because the parts have a discrete state, it means in joining them, you can detect and correct errors. And that threshold property may sound like a technicality, but it's exactly the difference between an analog telephone and the internet, or a differential analyzer and a PC. So the second difference is you can detect and correct state to correct errors to get an exponential reduction in error, which gives you an exponential increase in complexity. Next one is you can join Lego bricks made out of dissimilar materials. Um, uh, in the ribosome, there's 20 amino acids that represent the basic properties of life. It's very hard to 3D print like a conductor and an insulator and a semiconductor through the same process. And then the last one is when you're done with Lego, you don't put it in the trash. You take it apart and reuse it because there's state in the materials. Um, in a forest, there's no trash. You die and your parts get disassembled and you're made into new stuff. Um, when you make a 3D print or laser cut, when you're done, there's no, you know, there's, 
recycling attempts, but there's no real notion of reusing the parts. So the metrology coming from the parts, detecting and correcting errors, joining dissimilar materials, disconnecting, reusing the components, those are all the things Shannon and von Neumann taught us. They're digital fabrication, but the crucial distinction is the, the code isn't in the computer, it's actually in the materials themselves. It's digitizing physical reality. There's an exact historical alignment between going from analog to digital in communication, analog to digital in computation, and now analog to digital in fabrication. So that's the research revolution, digitizing fabrication, coding construction. Now what's interesting is the, the line, so Shannon and von Neumann um, were very aware of the physical context in doing this. Um, uh, you can trace what Shannon did back to roughly Maxwell's demon, the one molecule demon that seems to violate the second law of thermodynamics, Leo Szilard um, analysis of it, reducing it to a single molecule, Ralph Landauer's explanation. So Shannon was familiar with the history of all of that and what he did and credits it. Um, uh, I want to, we'll come back and talk about computing. Late in life, Turing with computing and von Neumann both started to think about geometry and physics in it. Um, Turing, von Neumann, Shannon were all very aware of this physical context and what they did in communication and computation. I, so I, I've been attributed and I'm happy to take claim for saying computer science is one of the worst things to happen to computers or to science because it's arbitrarily segregated the notion that computing happens in an alien world unlike physics. Yeah. yeah. So a year ago for the White House Science Technology Policy Office, I ran a meeting because every federal agency pretty much wanted to talk to me about their 3D printing initiative. Mm -hmm. And I was yelling at them that it's sort of shuffling deck chairs, that's not um, uh, the new opportunity and so I got together all of these agencies and then I got together the people at the frontiers of this emerging field of the deep sense of digital fabrication of coding construction and uh, what's emerging from that is in a whole bunch of areas we're discovering we can do things that were just uh, not considered remotely possible before uh, so, on the very smallest scale, the most exciting work on digital fabrication is the creation of life from scratch. Design, the cell does everything we're talking about, um, designing genomes, and we, we've had a great collaboration with the Bentner Institute on microfluidic machinery to load genes into cells. One step up from that, we're developing tabletop chip fab instead of a billion dollar fab. Uh, using um, discrete assembly of blocks of electronic materials to build things like integrated circuits in a tabletop process. Um, a step up from that, uh, we had a paper in Science last year showing we can make the world's highest performance ultralight material for things like airplanes um, by digitizing the composites and linking little loops of carbon fiber instead of making giant pieces. And so now we're working with the aerospace industry on making printers of jumbo jets, but the printers are really assemblers. Um, bigger scale, we're working with Homeland Security on landscape on demand. Katrina or Sandy do tens or hundreds of billions of dollars of damage. National technical means is bags of wet sand. And we're making robots that are like robotic ribosomes that link discrete parts to build geological scale features to make landscape. And we're working with NASA on doing this in space, leading up to the idea of how you bootstrap a civilization. And the really interesting um, uh, problem we're looking at there is, let's see, one of my favorite books, there's a series of books by Gingery on how to make a machine shop, starting with charcoal and iron ore. And you make a furnace and you melt it, and then you make hand tools, and then slowly you bootstrap up to make a machine shop. And, when people think about a notion like colonizing space and bootstrapping a civilization, that's what they're thinking of implicitly. But now come back to the ribosome again. There are 20 amino acids. With those 20 amino acids, you make the muscles and motors in my molecular muscles in my arm, you make the light sensors in my eye, you make my neural synapses. 
the way that works is the 20 amino acids don't encode light sensor or motor. It's very basic properties like hydrophobic, uh, hydrophilic, basic. Um, and with those 20 properties, you can make you. So in the same sense, digitizing fabrication in the deep sense means that with about 20 building blocks, conducting, insulating, semiconducting, magnetic, um, dielectric, you can assemble them to create modern technology. So reduce you know, DigiKey, the electronic parts vendor, sells 300,000 different kinds of resistors, but, but really at heart there's only three attributes, conducting, resistive, uh, insulating. And that's what we're doing. By discretizing those parts, we can make all those 300,000 resistors and everything else. So that's the revolution. It, it intellectually exactly aligns with digitizing communication and computation, but now for fabrication. In turn, the alignment is even closer with the history of computing. Where I realized this alignment was so close was to do this research, uh, uh, CBA got a big uh, NSF grant to buy machines and we wrote an ambitious proposal to get one of anything to make anything and that's luckily what we got funded which is an interesting story um, but I had a problem it would take too long to teach people to use all of those machines uh, so I started a class called how to make almost anything and that wasn't meant to be provocative it was just aimed at 10 or so research students to use the machines to do that research. And something strange happened, which is hundreds of students showed up to take a class for 10 people. And they would say things like, this is too useful, can you teach it at MIT? And every year, hundreds of students try to take this class. And then in turn, the next surprise was they weren't there for research, they weren't there for theses, they wanted to make stuff. And um, uh, so I taught additive, subtractive, 2D, 3D, form, function, circuits, programming, just all of these skills, not to do the research, but just using the existing machines today. And the students did projects, and so Kelly Dobson, who now runs digital media RISD, she made a device that saves up screams and plays it back later when it's convenient. And uh, Mi Jin Yoon, who runs architecture now at MIT, when she took the class, she made a dress instrumented with sensors and spines to defend your personal space. And that happened year after year until I finally got, uh, the students were answering what I hadn't asked, which is, what is this good for? I was asking, can you do digital fabrication? Um, I didn't think, it, it didn't even occur to me to ask why. It was obviously just such an interesting question. But what they were answering was, the killer app for digital fabrication is personal fabrication meaning not making what you can buy at Walmart, making what you can't buy in Walmart, making things for a market of one person. So now let's go back to the history. The, from the Project Sage whirlwind, um, MIT developed the first transistorized computers, the TX series. The TX series then got commercialized as digital equipment PDPs. Uh, the PDPs really gave us the internet. Um, so the internet, word processing, video games, um, just about everything you do on a computer today was first done in that era. This was the, the time of mini computers. Um, at that time, Route 128 in Boston was Wang, Prime, Data General, DEC, the whole computer industry. Every single one of them failed. Uh, the organizational lesson is it does, didn't matter how good you were at organizational change, they were just doomed. Now, Ken Olson, the head of DEC, famously said, nobody needs a computer in the home. Mini computers are a toy, they don't, uh, personal computers are a toy, they don't scale. You know, pl play with your toys, we'll make the real machines. Um, obviously, uh, uh, you have PCs in the home, and DEC is twice over bankrupt. DEC was bought by Compaq, Compaq was bought by HP. Now, but to play that forward, there were the mini computers. The mini computer industry completely misread PCs. Um, the transitional stage was in between mini computers and PCs were hobbyist computers. This was the era of the Altair. And the Altair was life-changing for people like me. It was the first computer you could own as an individual. It was almost useless. But the killer app was you could flip switches on a panel, load in a binary program, start it running, and the lights would blink. Yeah, so this was like late 
70s. Yeah, seven, late 70s was when that was beginning to happen. Yeah. So, a uh, mini computer, hobbyist computer, then PC. Mm -hmm. Now, to understand why a 3D printer isn't analogous to the PC, uh, when I w was at Bell Labs, we used PDP 1173s, and there was a rack, and in the rack there was a unit that's a processor, there's a unit that's storage, there's a unit that's communication, there's a unit that's power, there's a unit that's I.O., there's a unit that's graphics, there's all these systems, you have to plug them all into each other. It was hard to use, but... It brought the cost from a million dollars to a hundred thousand dollars and the size from a warehouse down to a room. And what that meant is a, a work group could have one. And when a work group could have one, it meant Kernigan and Ritchie at Bell Labs could invent Unix, which all modern operating systems descend from because they didn't have to get permission from a whole corporation to do it. Mm -hmm. Now, if you follow that history, um, the mini computer died, but the reality is every year the machines got faster, better, smaller, better integrated. So at the PC stage, what happened is graphics, storage, processing, I.O., all of the subsystems got put in the box. And so like the 10 subsystems of the PDP that were separate units all fit in one box. Um, now, to line that up with fabrication, the MIT's 1952 NC mill is similar to the million dollar machines in my lab today. These are the mainframes of fab. You need a big organization to have them. Mm -hmm. um, the fab labs I'll tell you about are exactly analogous to the cost and complexity of PC, of, of mini computers. The machines that make machines I'll tell you about are exactly analogous to the cost and complexity of the hobbyist computers. And the research we're doing, which is leading up to the Star Trek replicator, is what leads to the personal fabricator which is the integrated unit that makes everything. So now, let's do that in powers of 10. Uh, a, my research lab, think of it as 10 $1 million machines, so $10 million to, to make molecular nanoassemblers. Within that, there's a workshop, and think of that as a $1 million in $10, $100,000 machines, which is things like high-speed mills and water jet cutters and uh, very powerful lasers, but within that, there's a core set of tools that we used in things like the how to make class. And what happened was around, oh, about starting 10 years ago, uh, I was getting so much NSF money that uh, there was a law passed in Congress that big, big government programs need to measure social impact, called GIPRA. And um, NSF had no idea how to do it, so they turned to us and said we had to measure social impact. And we had no idea how to do it. But we had good NSF program managers, and so we thought rather than tell people what we're doing, we would give them the tools. And so we set up the first Fab Lab, and the idea of the Fab Lab is it's about a 100K investment. So think of it as 10, $10,000 machines. Um, and it's the basic set of tools today to do digital fabrication. Now, there's a casual sense, which means a computer controls something to make something, and then there's the deep sense, which is coding the materials. Intellectually, that difference is everything, but now I'm going to explain why it doesn't matter. And it's the following. The Fab Lab is two tons, $100,000 investment, fills a few thousand square feet. Um, 3D scanning and printing, uh, precision machining, you can make circuit boards, mold casting, tooling, um, computer controlled cutting with a knife, with a laser, large format machining, composite layups, surface mount rework, sensors, actuators, embedded programming. Technology to make technology. Um, think of it as a town library scale. You, you wouldn't ask your town library, do you want to skip literature or history? There's a basic set of things for knowledge. And so the Fab Lab is sort of like that for turning data to things, things to data. We set up one of those for NSF, and then they accidentally went viral. They've been doubling every year and a half. There's 400 now. There's about 400 coming. Um, they're above the Arctic Circle. They're at the bottom tip of Africa. They're in rural shanty towns. They're in big cities. Uh, we didn't plan that. We only set up one, but, but, but they just started doubling. Um, and now comes the historical alignment, which is the Internet didn't come after the iPhone. The Internet was invented in the mini-computer era. 
And every year the computing got faster, better, cheaper, and better integrated. But you didn't have to wait 20 years for mini computers to start using computers. You could use it then. And it's an exponential. You, it, socially, it looked like a revolution, but it was going from 1 to 2 to 4 to 8. On a log-log plot, it's just a straight line. In that same sense, we're 10 years into the doubling of Fab Labs. 10 years you can just plot this doubling. Today, you can send a design to a Fab Lab, and you need 10 different machines to turn the data into something. Um, 20 years from now, all of that will be in one machine that fits in your pocket. And so this is the sense in which it doesn't matter. You can do it today. How it works today isn't how it's going to work in the future, but you don't need to wait uh, 20 years for it. Anybody can make almost anything uh, almost anywhere. So let's play forward with some of the implications and then related to computing and communication. Yep. Um, so around this point, I began to realize that I was a victim of and was fixing a mistake from the Renaissance, which is in high school, I desperately wanted to go to the vocational school where you could weld and fix cars and do cool stuff like that. I was told, no, you're smart. You're not allowed to. And nobody could tell me what I, I, would, I had to sit in a room. It seemed punitive. Um, at Bell Labs, I had union grievances uh, because I would go try to make things in a workshop and they'd say, no, you're smart, you have to tell somebody else what to do. And it just didn't make sense. And finally, when I could own all these machines, I got that the Renaissance was when the liberal arts emerged. And this was li liberal for liberation, humanism, the trivium and the quadrivium. And those were a path to liberation, they were the means of expression. And that's the moment when art diverged from artisans. And there were the illiberal arts that were for commercial gain. So we've been living with this notion that making stuff is an illiberal art for commercial gain, and it's not part of means of expression. But in fact, today, 3D printing and micro-machining and in microcontroller programming are as expressive as painting paintings or writing sonnets, but they're not means of expression from the Renaissance. So we can finally fix that boundary between art and artisans. Now, in turn, technically, the roadmap we're going down now is very clear. If you take this alignment between mainframes, mini computers, hobbyist computers, PCs, the research tools we're using are like the mainframes. The fab labs are the mini computers. They're being used to do the equivalent of invent the internet. Mm -hmm. The next step in is we're doing a lot of work on machines that make machines. So you don't go to a fab lab to get to access to the machine, you go to the fab lab to make the machine. And so to do that, we've had to rip up CAD, CAM, machine control, motion control, all the ways you make stuff to make machines that make machines. So that's the next step in. Prototypes today, over the next maybe five years, we'll be transitioning from buying machines to using machines to make machines, self-reproducing machines. But they still have consumables, like the motors, and they still cut or squirt. And then, then the really interesting transition comes when we go from cutting or printing to assembling and disassembling, to um, moving to discreetly assembled materials. And that's when you do tabletop chip fab or make airplanes, that's when trash go, technical trash goes away because you can disassemble. An early version of that is Google's project Aura. Aura is one of my students. That's based on modular reconfigurable cell phones, intentionally as the first step down this roadmap. Instead of buying and throwing out a cell phone, it's made out of building blocks you can reconfigure. And the research is bit by bit, we'll, we'll, we'll reconfigure the blocks in the building blocks and then the blocks and the blocks in the building blocks. And so that's the maybe 20 year roadmap technically from where we are today. Now, the biggest surprise for me in this is I thought the research was hard. It's leading to how do you make the Star Trek replicator, and the insight now is that's an exercise in embodied computation, computation in materials, programming their construction. Um, hard, lots of work to come, but we know what to do. The thing that's been most surprising for me is uh, the consequences of this, the equivalent of the invent the internet. And so, um, as the fab labs have been spreading, uh, we've been working with heads of state and CEOs and tribal chiefs and community activists and generals and just all of these, uh, you know, create this amazing range um, because if anybody can make anything anywhere, it kind of challenges everything. So um, you know, start with education. Uh, I love the maker movement. 
And I also get very irritated by the maker movement um, for the failure in mentoring. Um, at something like a maker fair, there's hall after hall of repeated reinventions of bad 3D printers. And there isn't an easy process to take people from easy to hard. And so in the Fab Lab network, we had this problem that kids would come in all sorts of places all over the world, learn amazing skills, and then fall off a cliff. There'd be nowhere for them to go educationally. Um, and so we started a project out of desperation because we kept failing to work with schools called the Fab Academy. Now, to understand how that works, uh, MIT is based on scarcity. You assume the books are scarce, so you have to go there for the library. You assume tools are scarce, so you have to go there for the machines. You assume people are scarce, so you have to go there to see them. And geography is scarce, and so the, it adds up to we can fit a few thousand people at a time. And for those few thousand people, it works really well. But um, planets of a few billion people were off by six orders of magnitude. Now, in computing terms, MIT is a mainframe. You go there and get processed. Um, I really don't like MOOCs, a massive online classes that trumpet our class has a million people in it. It's just not education as I understand it. A person sitting at a screen, it's like time sharing. There's still a mainframe, and you're a terminal plugged into the mainframe. Um, the way the Fab Academy works in computing terms, it's like the internet. Students have peers with work groups, with mentors, surrounded by machines in labs locally. Then we connect them globally by video and content sharing and all of that. And so it, it's an educational network. There's, there are these critical masses of groups locally, and then we connect them globally. And so we started teaching the same digital fabrication class I teach at MIT, how to make almost anything. But now instead of just teaching it at MIT, we're teaching it using the whole planet as the campus. Mm -hmm. Amusingly, I went to my friends at EduCause about ed, um, accrediting the Fab Academy, and they said, we love it, where are you located? And I said, yes, and they said, no, meaning we're all over the earth. And they said, we have no mechanism, we're not even allowed to do that. There's no notion of global accreditation. Um, but they said something really helpful, they said, pretend. And what they meant was um, do a skills-based self-accredit with skills-based portfolio where people document skills, and at some future date we'll figure out how to accredit you. Mm -hmm. And that's been working great. Uh, of all the questions we get, the one question we never ever get is who accredited us because the content speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. So now the interesting thing in turn is um, uh, we're now teaching this global version of a digital fabrication class using the whole Fab Lab network. Um, a lot of what we've done isn't tied specifically to digital fabrication, but what I didn't get at the outset was um, digital communication means we can talk to each other at a distance. I run a giant video bridge where we have 100 site video conferences where everybody talks to everybody, where each of those sites is not just a person, it's a work group. Digital computing means you can store the knowledge of the world to get access to that. The profound piece is digital fabrication means you can bring the campus to the student, not the student to the campus. Once you have a basic set of tools, you can make all the rest of the tools. So um, next year we're starting a new class with George Church that we've called How to Grow Almost Anything, which is using fab labs to make bio labs and then teach biotech in it. We're really building sort of this global university. And part of what I like about MIT is that um, uh, John Reed, who was chairman of MIT's corporation, came to see what this is all about. And it's, instead of anyway being threatened, he was just delighted to see it. Because his comment was, you know, the, the, this is how you change MIT. It's sort of, you know, change the world, MIT will catch up to it. It's, um, there's a core set of skills a place like MIT can do, but it alone doesn't scale to a billion people. Mm -hmm. This is taking the social engineering, the character of MIT, but now doing it on this global scale. So the implications in turn for this, uh, this isn't my core competence. I know how to invent the machines, mm -hmm. but I can describe what's been happening. Um, so to understand the economic and social implications, um, look at 
software and look at music to understand what's happening now for fabrication. Software at one time was Microsoft or IBM. Uh, you know, a few exceptional people could write it for themselves, but you know, it was Microsoft or IBM. Uh, open source came along. There's a brief spike of yippee, it's free, nobody ever pays anything for anybody ever. What's settled down now is we still have Microsoft or IBM, but with all respect to colleagues there, arguably that's the least interesting part of software. The most interesting stuff is if you think about uh, app development. You can write little scripts for yourself. You can write an app for 10 people or 100 or 1,000 or a billion. And if you look at the ferment of software writing, there, there's powers of 10. Mainframes didn't go away, but... Um, what opened up is all these tiers of software development that weren't economically viable. So if you know you look at your phone and look at the diversity of the apps you use and how you use them, um, they're, they're, they're being developed and sold. Some are given away, some you pay a few dollars, some you pay more, but they're being developed and sold into markets that just weren't viable on the scale of Microsoft or IBM. Mm -hmm. So a string of data becomes an algorithm, becomes a program. Now look at music. Music was the labels or you play your piano. Um, Napster comes along, yippee, it's free, nobody ever pays anybody for anything. Then it's settled now, and if you look at tracks of music, so in software, copy protection failed. Easily circumvented by dishonest people, irritating to honest people, you know, copy protection doesn't work anymore. In music, there was digital rights management, easily circumvented by dishonest people, irritating for honest people. Amazon sells you tracks without protecting them, but they make it easy to buy and sell. The labels fought it tooth and nail. Now it's beginning to finally turn around. And if you look at music development, the most interesting stuff in music isn't the big labels. It's, it's all the tiers of music that weren't viable before. So you can you know, make music for yourself for one, ten, a hundred, a thousand, a million. If you look at the you know, tracks on your device, it's, it's this, this ferment of music on tiers that weren't economically viable. So in that example, it's a string of data and becomes a sound. Now in digital fab, it's a string of data and becomes a thing. It doesn't replace mass manufacturing, but mass manufacturing becomes the least interesting stuff where everybody needs the same thing. And instead, what you open up is all these tiers that weren't viable before. Okay. Now in turn, what is it good for? And um, the answer to that in some ways is almost the opposite of what you think, which is um, you can make all kinds of stuff, but the real value we're seeing in digital fabrication is one step removed. It's the benefits of having made it. So to understand that, remember Google doesn't sell search. They give away search and they sell the benefits of having searched, which is advertising. Um, Facebook doesn't sell talking to your friends. It gives away talking to your friends. It sells the benefits of having talked to your friends. Mm -hmm. That lesson, it took about 10 years for the dot-com industry to realize pretty much across the board, you don't directly sell the thing, you kind of sell the benefits of the thing. And so to understand what that means for digital fab, um, the most obvious thing you can do is invent a widget and sell it. Um, and you invent the widget and then you go to China and mass manufacture it. Now it happens, we're working very closely with Shenzhen. Um, there's a meeting of all the Fab Lab network. It's in Boston 2015, 2016 it's in Shenzhen because they're pivoting from mass manufacturing to enabling personal fabrication. So we've set Shenzhen as the goal in 2016 for Fab Lab 2.0, which is Fab Labs making Fab Labs. But to rewind now, you could send it to Shenzhen and mass manufacture it. There's a more interesting thing you can do, which is um, you can send the design, you go to market by shipping data, and you produce it on demand locally. And so you produce it all around the world locally. There's a parallel with um, HP and inkjet printing. Um, HP's printer division, inkjet division is in Corvallis, Oregon, because they had to hide from um, Palo Alto because uh, they were told, the, the advocates, that inkjet printing would never scale, it would never be fast enough. But their point was, a lot of printers producing beautiful pages slowly scales if all the pages are different. And so in the same sense, it scales to fabricate 
globally by doing it locally, not by shipping the products, but shipping the data. But there's a more interesting thing, which is what, what is work? You, you know, for the average person, uh, it's a, not the people who write for Edge, but just an average person working, you, you leave home to go to a place you'd rather not be, doing a repetitive operation you'd rather not do, you know, making something designed by somebody you don't know for somebody you'll never see, to get money to then go home and buy something. But what if you could skip that and just make the thing? <laughs> and to make that really concrete, uh, Vicente Gallart was a colleague who started the first Fab Lab in Barcelona. Um, he's now the city architect, the planner of the future of Barcelona. Mm -hmm. He's putting fab labs in every district in the city as part of the urban infrastructure. And so the idea is there, IKEA, you know, they consider IKEA the enemy um, because IKEA divines taste. Far away, they make furniture and flat pack it. You go to a big box store, great design sense in Barcelona, but 50% youth unemployment, whole generation can't work. You know, you, limited jobs, but ships come in from the harbor, you buy stuff in a big box store, um, and then after a while, trucks go off to a trash dump. And so they describe it as products in, trash out. Ships come in, products, trash go out. What they want to do is what they call uh, DITO, data in, data out. So the, the bits come and go, globally connected for knowledge, but the atoms stay in the city. So the idea is you have fab labs in every district in the city, and then when you want furniture or consumer goods or all of that, instead of working to get money to buy products made somewhere else, you can make them locally. And you might pay somebody for it, mm -hmm. but whether or not you pay for it, the notion is you don't need the money to get the thing. You have access, you know, the cities provide electricity and light and sewers. Now it's this new notion of infrastructure. If they provide the means to make stuff as part of the infrastructure of the city. So in Barcelona's case, um, the attraction is whether or not you make anything any different from what you're buying today, it means you can make many of the things you consume directly rather than this very odd remote economic loop. Let me to, to talk about what you can make, um, so again, Today, it requires 10 different machines in a fab lab. In 20 years, it's all integrated in one machine. Mm -hmm. uh, but a good index is what people do make in fab labs or the how to make class. Mm -hmm. And it, it's awfully close to the range of things today. So you know, one good example is furniture. A anything IKEA makes, you can make in a fab lab. There's the biggest tool, a shop bot, is a four foot by eight foot by one foot NC mill. And you can make um, beautiful furniture with it. That's what furniture shops use. So you can plot out custom furniture. Um, uh, another example has to do with mobility. So people make uh, bicycle frames. Um, there's serious projects making DIY cars. There's some one step before that is like super go karts, and there's some very serious project making cars. Uh, boats are all made in Fab Labs. Um, consumer electronics. Um, you can make. Um, uh, antennas, radios, there's a couple surprisingly successful DIY phone projects. And the most interesting part of the DIY phone projects is if you're making a do-it-yourself phone, um, you can also start to make the things that the phones talk to. And so you can start to build your own telco providers where the users provide the network rather than spending lots of money on uh, AT&T or whoever. Really, to a surprising extent, almost any of the things you buy today um, you can make, there's consumables, but you can make using the tools in the fab lab. Uh, let, let, let's, let's keep playing through the benefits of doing it. Um, so, so one is this economic one. Um, uh, we helped the White House plan a White House Maker Fair. Mm -hmm. And we set up a mobile fab lab literally outside the Oval Office. This is one of the most sensitive places at the White House. Even if you have a White House badge, you cannot stand outside the window of the Oval Office because it's such a sensitive place. So the White House guards were going crazy because we had all our big lasers and machines outside the Oval Office. So President Obama loved it. And what was going on there was uh, they, the administration couldn't directly say to American manufacturing, you're Wang and Prime and Data General, <laughs> but they can demonstrate it. And it's similar to we had a fab lab at the World Economic Forum this year for uh, last year for heads of state and CEOs, 
And it's the same thing. It's saying to traditional manufacturing, um, which looks on all of this as a toy, traditional manufacturing is exactly replaying the script mm -hmm. of the computer company saying that's a toy. And it's shining a light to say, this creates entirely new economic activity. The new jobs don't come back to the old factories. The, the, the ability to make stuff on demand is creating entirely new jobs. So there's one Danish fab lab that's been focused on incubating businesses. And they counted in 10 years, the community lab uh, made 1,000 jobs and 300 million euros in turnover. And you multiply that by all of these labs. And it, you know. It, the new jobs just don't aren't coming back to the old factories. But now in turn, to keep playing that forward, um, when I was in Barcelona for the meeting of all these labs hosted by the city architect in the city, um, the mayor, Trias, uh, pushed a button that started a 40-year countdown to self-sufficiency, not protectionism, globally connected for knowledge, but the notion is Barcelona produces what it consumes. And Shenzhen is pivoting to help provide the technology for it. And that's what the White House Maker Faire was about. Uh, why am I helping Shenzhen as a red-blooded American is two levels deep. Um, uh, one level deep is uh, my ability to do everything I'm describing rests on a global supply chain that crucially passes through places like Shenzhen. I, you know, I need high torque efficient motors with integrated lead screws at low cost, custom produced on demand. All sorts of the building blocks that let us do what I'm doing rest on a global supply chain including China's manufacturing agility. And so uh, the short term answer is you can't get rid of them because we need them in the supply chain. But the long term answer is Shenzhen sees the future isn't mass producing for everybody. There's a transitional stage of producing locally. But in turn, what we see is when you gather all these fab labs, as I've been doing once a year, um, the, the network is, and to be clear, we're not telling people they should become part of this. Every, each of these doublings is people opting in to join. But there's rich, poor, north, south, east, west, rural, urban. Mm -hmm. And it's all the same person, basically. And so this leads to the social engineering. And um, I, my description of MIT's core competence is it's a safe place for strange people. The, the, these real anomalously inventive people that wouldn't function in normal society work in a place like that. Mm -hmm. um, the real thing, ultimately, that's driving the fab labs, that the vacuum we filled is a technical one, the means to make stuff. Nobody was providing that. But in turn, the spaces become magnets. Everybody talks about innovation or knowledge economy, but then most things label that, strangle it. The labs become vehicles for bright inventive people who don't fit locally to fit. And so you can think about sort of the culture of MIT, but on this global scale. As viewed from that, my allegiance isn't to our border versus anybody else's border. It's to the brain power of the planet. The, the, uh, I don't know how far this goes. Bright, inventive people whose lives are being transformed by this, you know, guessing, say, call it one in a hundred. But uh, billions of people on the planet means you know, tens or hundreds of millions of these bright, inventive people that are exactly the kind that keeps me happily based at MIT. But we find them in... Arctic villages and African shanty towns, and so my allegiance isn't to any one border; it's to the brain power of the planet, and th this is building the infrastructure to scale to that brain power. Let me pause to relate digital fabrication to digital communication and digital computing technically, and then play out some of the implications. Mm -hmm. um, our modern computer architecture dates; you can date it to von Neumann, and you can, in a sense trace from von Neumann back to Turing, and both of those were accidents. Turing's machine was never meant to be an architecture, it was to a theoretical construct for a proof. Von Neumann wrote things he considered profound. Um, he never really wrote about his architecture. The most he did was he wrote an, a report on how to program the EDVAC. Um, Turing's machine and von Neumann's architecture are completely unphysical. Best way to say it is, the head of a Turing machine is distinct from a tape. And the reason that's so important for being unphysical is a patch of reality 
in nature, takes time to transit, stores state, um, admits interaction, and occupies volume. All those resources are coupled. In computer science, there's a fiction that they're unrelated. And so computing happens in a pretend world that we then try to make work in a real world. And a lot of what's hard now in computing, programming, multi-core computing, cache concurrency, backplane bandwidth, has to go, it's like the matrix, going from the pretend world to the physical world. There's a completely different parallel history of computing where you make hardware look like software. So if you zoom from transistors to microcode to, to object code to a program, they don't look like each other. But if we take this room and go from city, state, country, it's hierarchical, but you preserve geometry. So computation violates geometry, uh, unlike most anything else we do. There's an independent history of computing where you make hardware look like software, and so computer science scales like physics because it's based on physics. And it turns out in many ways that's easier, not harder to do. And the reason that's so important for the digital fabrication piece is once we build molecular assemblers that build arbitrary systems, you don't want to then paste a few lines of code in it. You need to overlay computation with geometry. And so it's leading to this complete kind of do-over of computer science. And then to relate another piece to that intersection, um, there's a lot of hype now about the Internet of Things. And that's a really strange one. I did early work with a number of the Internet architects on what became called Internet of Things. And the core architectural principle is the internet succeeded over the bitnet because what it does is defined by what you connect to the network. The state is at the edges of the network. A lot of what's called internet of things today is actually bitnet of things, meaning it's dumb devices connected to central sites you can't control. What makes the internet work is the state is pushes to the edges so you don't need central control to invent it. So now if you take digital fab, plus the real sense of Internet of Things, not the garbled sense, plus the real future of computing, aligning hardware and software, it all adds up to this ability to program reality. We're going to bring the programmability of the digital world into the physical world. It's going to be much bigger than the earlier digital revolutions because it's out here where we live. But in turn, um, there's a whole series of you go back to Wang and Prime and Data General, there's a whole bunch of incumbent uh, entities across, if you take how we live, learn, work, play, how we divide all of those. Um, the next Silicon Valley isn't a valley. The, the, there's this race for what is the next place going to be. Um, when you connect digital communication with computation, with um, communication, computation, and fabrication, what you do is you create networks. Um, they're collaborating networks where you can see people, you can interact with people, you can share content, and crucially, bits become atoms, atoms become bits. I can do something, I can put it into the computer, it can come out on your side and become a thing again. Um, and so I run a giant video infrastructure and I have collaborators all over the world. I see more than many of my collaborators at MIT because um, we're all too busy on campus. Mm -hmm. um, and so the next Silicon Valley is a network. It's not a place. Um, and invention happens in these networks. One of the reasons that's so important is um, that we're at a, it's a funny historical moment. Um, one of my students, Jason Taylor, who did a thesis with me on molecular quantum control, is in charge of all of Facebook's infrastructure. He, he's building all their data centers and all the scaling of it. Um, one of my students, Rafi Krikorian, who did the early work with a dear colleague, Danny Cohen, on the beginning of Internet of Things, is running all of uh, Twitter's infrastructure. Um, a number of former students are in these really unexpected places in the tech revolution. And I think it's not just a historical accident. It has to do with sort of being grounded in reality and thinking deeply. That 
I was at Bell Labs before deregulation, which was one of the most wonderful research I was environments I was ever in. And it, it was merciless. People would come and get mowed down and be challenged, but then they would push back. And you weren't meant to be there forever. It would forever turn over, and there was endless energy in it. Um, and it, uh, at MIT, if you add up, it's the world's 11th, businesses from it, it's the world's 11th economy. It's trillions of dollars of volume. Uh, fewer single billion dollar companies, but lots and lots of like hundred million dollar companies. Um, but it all sort of doesn't matter. The, um, you, know, uh, you earn your way from what you do each day and your pedigree doesn't matter and there's all kinds of turnover and all kinds of energy. But if you compare it to things like um, uh, when Edwin Land was kicked out of Polaroid, he made the Roland Institute, which was making um, an ideal research institute with the best facilities and the best people and they could do whatever they want and rough, a couple of things, but almost nothing came from it because there was no turnover of the gene pool, there was no evolutionary pressure. And um, John Bell's Bell's theorem was published in a journal, Physics, which was only for, designed for only for the smartest people, and ordinary people couldn't publish it, and it expired because there was no turnover and no evolutionary pressure. And the way I think it's related to this conversation is a lot of tech industry is recreating a failed history of the wrong way to do research, which is to believe there's a privileged set of people that know more from anybody else and to create a barrier that inhibits communication from the inside to the outside, rather than recognizing the attributes of you need evolutionary pressure, you need traffic, you need to be forced to deal with people you don't think you need to encounter, um, and you need to recognize to be disruptive it helps to know what people know. And so you do your homework, you know what people know, then you can turn around and blow it up, but against the background of having done your homework and occupying at that valley. And those lessons in how to run research, standard recurring ones, and right now I think a lot of the tech industry is in the process of, of getting them wrong, but the resolution isn't gonna be a better billion dollar company, I think. It's gonna be, you know, it, again, it, Business is going to move into distributed networks, and education is moving into distributed networks. And you know, one person in one fab lab in one village can be a node in a network doing economic activity and doing research and getting education. It really turns on its hot side all of our organizations. And so for me, the hardest thing isn't the research. That's humming along nicely. It's, it's we're finding we have to build completely new kind of social order. And that kind of social entrepreneurship, figuring out how you live, learn, work, play is really hard. And there's a very small set of people who can really do that kind of organizational creation.